Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When it comes to the issue of race in the Muslim American leadership, uh, I would suggest that there are three things that we ought to think about. One, the fact that race is not real, but racism is. Two, that prejudice is a very, very powerful thing. And three, the mighty multicultural community of Muhammad wasalam, is the way forward. If we look at these three things, I think we'll have a way of shifting the paradigm when it comes to race in the United States of America in the 21st century. Because when I look at what's going on inside of the Muslim community and outside of the Muslim community, I think we're caught in a paradigm that's not useful to us as human beings. Let's take a closer look at these three ideas. Number one, race is not real, but racism is a reality. So if we look at the Quran, which is the source of knowledge for all Muslims, if we look at this, we understand that Allah Ta'ala says in uh, the first uh, verse, or the first verse of Surah an Nisa, Ya ayyun nasa taqul rabbikum udhi kalakuh min nafsin wahida. O humanity, be conscious of your Lord, who's created you from one person, and from that one person created his mate, and from the two of them created countless men and women throughout the earth to the end of the ayah. So for me, from the Muslim's perspective, that sells the matter, that we understand that all human beings on the face of the earth come from one person. We understand that if we look at each other, and no matter where we come from, we have the all, all have the same common ancestor. This is also true when you look at Darwinism, when you go from Dean to Darwinism. And unfortunately, many Darwinists, like the, the famous biologist uh, Richard Dawkins, are atheists and anti-religious. When you look at them, you, what you'll find is they'll They'll talk about religion in a very disparaging way, but they agree with Quran and Nisa one, that we're all created from one person. So race as we talk about it, race as we deal, deal with it, is both a religious fiction, because what Allah says goes, and a biological fiction, in the sense that the people who rule biology these days are Darwinists, and it's their understanding that we're all created from one person. So race is not real. It's also a social construct. In other, way, in other words, the way you're seen racially has often more to do with where you are than who you are. Uh, if you compare Boston with Brazil, for instance, Boston, Massachusetts, with any uh, city in Brazil that has uh, people of African descent, what you'll find is that the people who are called black uh, in Boston and the people who are called black in Brazil are not exactly the same people, simply because the construct known as race is seen very differently in Latin America. All you have to do is travel throughout Latin America. But I picked Brazil for a particular reason, and I'll tell you that in a moment. If you, if you travel throughout Latin America, you'll find that the concept of blackness and whiteness is very, very different and seen very differently in Latin America than it is in the United States. And so if you compare this blackness in Boston and blackness in Brazil, two things come to mind. Number one, uh, the whole notion of color consciousness is not exactly the same, even though there is color consciousness in Brazil. And number two, even though those of us who live in the United States of America think that Harlem and places like Boston are centers of the black world. The reality is that the largest number of people of African descent who live in the Western Hemisphere live in the country of Brazil. And they don't talk about their blackness. And all you have to do is you can Google it. Everybody can Google it. And you can look at the videos. And you see the connectedness between uh, Africanness, but not the same kind of blackness that they talk about in the United States. And so, therefore, not only is race a biological fiction on one hand, it's also 
a social construct. That is, it has more to do with where you are uh, than who you are that determines what race you are. The other thing about race not being a reality is that it is also constrained by time. And what I mean by this is that if you look at race over time in the United States of America, particularly when you look at it in regards to immigration in this country, you'll find that many of the people that we call, quote, white people right now, were not white 100 years ago or uh, 200 years ago. They were certainly not white in the sense that we think of them today. There's a, a book called When the Irish Became White, because when the Irish became here, they were seen as outsiders. They were seen as people to be feared. They were seen as people to be marginalized. And so now, today, there's still some uh, discrimination against Irish people in certain places in the United States. But however, uh, in essence, Irish people are seen as white. That wasn't true when they first came here. And so we see this concept of race being very fluid, and it has more to do with power and relationships than it has to do with some kind of essence. So race is not real, but racism is. All we have to do is look at what's going on in the United States as we speak. And we see the kinds of rantings that we have against people of color, whether they're coming across the southern border, whether they're Muslims, because uh, many people code Muslims as brown people, and whether they're African Americans, a significant number of them being shot down in the street by officers of the law. And Sometimes it's intentional and sometimes it's unintentional, but what everybody can agree on is that the race, racial politics and something called implicit bias has something to do with the inordinate amount of shootings, uh, fatal shootings of African Americans on the streets of the United States of America. So my first point is that race is not real, but racism absolutely is. The second point is that uh, prejudice is a very, very powerful thing. Uh, we talk about it a lot. We talk about people being prejudiced. And we know that people can be prejudiced both for and against people. But the reality is that it can do some very, very powerful positive things and can do some very, very powerful negative things in relationship to individuals and groups. And when we think of this for a moment, we Think about what happened in particular to uh, Jews, uh, gypsies, uh, people with disabilities, homosexuals in Nazi Germany. It's a very, very powerful thing. If you can convince people that somehow people are less than other people, then it could lead to attempts to exterminate those people. There's a seminal book on this called, which I would recommend if you want to understand this notion of race and Muslim American leadership. Uh, it's a book that was written quite a while ago, and I do a lot of reading about race and prejudice. I think it's one of the best books out, out there. It's called The Nature of Prejudice by uh, a guy named Gordon Allport, A-L-L-P-O-R-T. In this book, The Nature of Prejudice, he talks about five levels of acting out prejudice. And I think it's instructive when you think about the power of prejudice in a particular society and how it moves from a mild situation to an extreme situation where people are thinking about exterminating other people. And so all put uh, early on in the book, in the first chapter of the book, he talks about the five levels of acting out prejudice. The first level is anti-locution. And it, you can guess the meaning of it, anti-locution against uh, uh, words, right? So it means uh, talking negatively about people. This means telling jokes about a particular group of people, telling jokes about black people, about Arabs, about Muslims, about white people, about blinds, about Polish. There are all kinds of jokes that are aimed at particular groups in the American society that are what Allport would call anti-locution. And he calls this the mildest form of acting out prejudice. The next uh, form of acting out prejudice is, uh, as Allport outlines it, the next form of acting out prejudice is avoidance. That is, if a Polish person comes in a room, or a black person comes in a room, or a blonde comes in a room, 
because you don't feel that that person should be around you, you make sure that you're not around uh, him or her. And this is a personal choice that you make. That's the next strongest form of acting out prejudice. The third form of acting out prejudice, according to Allport, is uh, discrimination. This is the codification of number two. That is, putting it into a formal rule, a formal decision, a formal law, a formal court decree that decrees that one group of people is less than another group of people. And uh, I personally experienced this myself growing up in the segregated South. When I went downtown in Roanoke, Virginia, there was white water and colored water. And this was by law. I went to a segregated school system by law. I had to sit in the back of the bus uh, in Roanoke, Virginia by law. And in the state of Virginia up until the 1960s, it was against the law for, for a so-called white person and a so-called black person to get married. This is the codification of the discrimination because people have seen people as being less than. So that's the third form of acting out prejudice that Allport talks about. The first, the mildest being anti locution The second, uh, avoidance, personal avoidance. The third is codification. And I experienced it myself with the Jim Crow laws in the South. And it's not only laws, by the way. There's something called restricted covenants. There's something called restricted covenants that you find all over the United States, but particularly in the Northeast, where a person will give a piece of land to a municipality as long as you don't allow a, for a park, to a municipality for a park, or to build uh, public housing, or to do something in the, for the public good, as long as you don't allow certain people to come on that land, to occupy the housing, uh, to frequent the park. And so these are called restrictive covenants. So this kind of codification is not necessarily a blanket law. It could be an agreement between two people in a contract. Like a land deed, you'll find a lot of restrictive covenants on a land deed. And so this is the third form of acting out prejudice that you find, according to Allport. The fourth form of acting out prejudice, which is the next highest form, is personal attack. attack. Um, personal attack, uh, physical attack, I'm sorry. Physical attack comes when, for instance, a person goes into the wrong section of town. Again, I've experienced this myself when I lived in the, in the northern city, which I won't name at this particular point, uh, where people would go into that part of the city, uh, of the town, and people would want to run them out of town simply because they were black people. And so this is the fourth and the most, uh, next to the most active form of acting out prejudice. The fifth is uh, extermination. So you go from the least, anti-locution, talking negatively, to the next highest, avoidance. The next highest is codification or discrimination. The next is physical attack. And the next is, uh, is the extermination. The textbook example of this, of course, that might come to your mind is Nazi Germany, because the uh, what what Hitler did to the Jews and others, it wasn't just uh, Jewish people, what he did to Jews and others started with negative talk. Then it moved to avoidance, people not wanting to hire people, not wanting to be around people. Then uh, laws were enacted to restrict the rights of certain people, especially the Jews. And then uh, the night, uh, an example was Kristallnacht, um, I think around 80 years ago, that happened wherein Jews were attacked. And then uh, the final solution. Uh, the things that Allport, and this is instructed to us as people who live in the United States of America, said about this, these five levels is that uh, a organization, or I'm sorry, an, a, a country or culture does not move automatically from one, two, three, four, five. That's number one. Number two, just because you, you individually do one doesn't mean you'll do two, in other words. Just because you talk neg negatively about a group of people doesn't mean that you move to the next level and the next level and the next level. But what he did say, and I agree with him, is that you seldom move from one, from zero to five. If you find a program to attack people, a program to exterminate people, you'll find that what preceded it was negative talk, avoidance, and discrimination. 
That's why I recommend to us as individuals to leave off the jokes about people who are different from us, no matter how funny they are, simply because maybe you won't do something negative against those people, but maybe the, the people in your social circle who might be influenced by it will hear them and they avoid, and then avoidance leads to discrimination and so on. And, the and a, a culture can move up and, and spiral back down. But my point is, is that, and mashallah, this is Islamic, you know, we should guard our tongues. If we guard our tongues, it makes it harder to move to the, to the next level. So prejudice is an extremely, extremely, extremely powerful thing. So when we look at the United States of America today, particularly uh, with the last couple of elections, one with the election of Barack Hussein Obama, uh, as the president of the United States, and the next with Donald Trump as election uh, as the president of the United States, we see that both of these elections, that is the election of Obama twice as president of the United States and the election of, of Donald Trump as president of the United States, rolled up the racial feelings within the United States of America. Uh, during uh, Obama's administration, people literally uh, people would, would shout at him in Congress and they would call him names and you don't want to go on the internet uh, and Google Obama's name because you'll see all the kind of racial slurs that we thought we'd forgotten in this country. And so w what we're living in right now and is an era we're in, racial hostility or racial animus has become a very, very powerful thing. So the question gets to be what can we as people moving, living in this country what can Muslims in particular do about it? And uh, what comes to mind is uh, my wife and I, Matina Yahya, who's a chaplain. Now, I used to run youth camps at the Masjid, Masjid al-Islam, where we most often pray in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, and uh, we used to run youth camps for young people. And one of the things we used to do was remind them that they were part of the mighty, multicultural community of Muhammad, alayhi salat wa salam the mighty multicultural community of Muhammad alayhi salat wa salam. So what's the point here? That if we want to be about the business of being in the leadership position in terms of solving something as important as the race problem in the United States, if we want to be in the leadership of dealing with the racial balkanization that we find within our own Muslim community ought not to be if we're following the way of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. We'll think about mining, mining our own legacy in terms of doing it, uh, in terms of looking at the mighty multicultural community of Muhammad Wasallam. I would suggest the three R's in do doing so. First of all, is re the first R means to reclaim reclaim our history, reclaim our legacy. What, what do I mean by this? What I mean by this is that if you look at the seerah, the biography of our beloved Prophet Leislat from Salam, you'll find that from the beginning, the Muslim community was a multicultural community. From the beginning, the Muslim community was a multicultural community. All of us know the story of Bilal, uh, who was uh, uh, may Allah be pleased with, with him, was part uh, Arab and part Ethiopian. All of, all of us know the story of Salman the Persian. May Allah be pleased with him, uh, was, was, who was, was Persian, <clears throat> and others. And so from the beginning, and, and we should think about this for a moment, because this was what we would call a tribal society at that particular time. And uh, there was no doubt, if you read the Sirah, if you read the Hadith, if you read, uh, reflect upon what the alim, the, the scholars uh, uh, say about our beloved Prophet Islam, he loved his people. He loved Mecca. But in spite of loving his people and loving Mecca, the bottom line was loving Allah. And that the kind of world that was the Quranic worldview, right? Allah makes this clear. We started there with Surah and Nisa at 1 that we all came from one person. Uh, we are often fond of quoting uh, 49.13, uh, 
El Hujarat 13. Uh, if, if, if God had wanted to make you one person, he would have done so. He, he did so in order to try you, so, to, so, uh, so uh, this is a test for you. So we understand that, and so we should reclaim this, this narrative. The narrative that made the people of Yathrib, which became Medina, seek out our beloved Prophet Islam to be the final arbiter of their disagreements. My understanding of the Sirah is that those people who came to God came and got him, they came and got him not because he was the prophet so much, but because it was a diverse community in Yathrib at this particular time. It was not a community of Muslims. It was a community of both Mushriks, people who were uh, idol worshippers, and Yahud, uh, and there were Jewish people there, but they had trouble keeping the peace. And our beloved Prophet was brought there. Uh, of course, the Muslims wanted, wanted him there because of the deen, but the others wanted him there because he had a reputation as a, as a peacekeeper. He was known as al -Amin, the trustworthy, and his reputation preceded him. And so that hijra, that immigration from Mecca to Medina was a transformative immigration that transformed not only the city of Yathrib into Medina, but it ultimately ended, uh, ended up within 30 years of the death of, of our beloved Prophet transforming the civilized world. And this was the mighty multicultural community of Muhammad So that's the first thing we need to reclaim. We need to mine. We need to reclaim that, that usul, that beginning. And we should make it our own rather than a part of history. We should reclaim the ethos of that. The second thing we need to do is that we need to regain the moral high ground. Part of our problem uh, in, in today's age and time is that we're so defensive because so many people are attacking us from so many vectors, from conspiracy theorists to people in high political offices, that we are inclined to take on their particular way. I would suggest that our beloved Prophet, if you look at him, he always took the moral high ground, whether he was dealing with individuals or he was dealing with people who had abused him, dealing with individuals who were coming to visit him, and you know the stories better than I, or when he came triumphant into Mecca after he beat the Quraysh and he was forgiving. And this is the way we should be. We should not, we should not adopt the ways and the ethos of the people who are abusing us with their words. We should not abuse them. This is clear in the Islamic ethos. So the first thing is we need to reclaim our narrative. The second thing is we need to reclaim the more high ground the third is that we need to recalibrate for this place and this time. Our wahi, the Quran came to a specific people in a specific time, but it's a message for all humanity. And so that's why we need to be about the business as we are at Yaqeen, at the business of doing research in this place and in this time and using our particular usul in order to make sense out of what we should do here and now. So that's my take on the whole idea of race in Muslim American leadership. That is to say that race, race is not real, but racism is. That prejudice is a very powerful thing, of course, that we should avoid. And third, that uh, we should take on the, 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 the example uh, of the mighty Muslim community of Muhammad alayhi salat wa salam. And if we do that, we'll become the leaders not only in the Muslim community, and, but also in the broader community as well. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.